and uh, we're going to move on with our study uh, today. We started last week, we began looking at the 14th chapter of the book of First Corinthians, and we're going to continue with the 14th chapter of Corinthians, but let's go to the Lord. Master Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the bread of life that you have given to us. This wonderful document contains the wisdom of God. It contains today, God, uh, that which inspires us, encourages us, instructs us, and helps us to walk in deep communion and fellowship with you. And Lord, as we dive into the Word of God, as we learn more about you, more about your ways, more about your gifts that you've bestowed upon the church, we find ourselves being drawn deeper and deeper into a more intimate, personal relationship with our Creator and our Redeemer and our King. Master, bless this Bible study tonight. Help us, Lord, to glean from the pages of your word important uh, lessons that we might learn. Help us to understand your gifts today, O oh God, and help us to desire the better gifts that we might be a blessing and a help to the church and work of God in the earth. Master, night is fast encroaching upon us. And you declared night would come and no man would be able to work. And we are very shortly, Lord, to see nightfall. And there will be no more opportunity to evangelize. There will be no more opportunity to reach out to the lost. Help us, Master, in the name of Jesus, to quickly do the important work that we must do because, Lord, we believe you're coming as promised. We thank you for this day. Anoint the speaker, the teacher, anoint the ear of every hearer, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay, we begin our Bible study looking at the nine gifts of the Spirit as articulated in the first 11 verses of chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Then we kind of jumped over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because it is this chapter that the Apostle Paul devoted to um, some instruction on practical aspects of the gifts, especially as they related to uh, the gift of speaking with other tongues. And um, the Word of God said that in the book of Acts, they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, growing up in the Pentecostal church, the way that was always interpreted uh, was when you speak in tongues, it is the Holy Ghost giving you the words, you know, almost like the Spirit of the Lord is feeding you the words, which is, honestly, it's kind of ridiculous if you, if you think about it. But anyway, but that's the way I grew up. That's kind of the way it was taught, you know. In other words, every time you speak in tongues, it's really not you, it's the Spirit of the Lord kind of working through you, you know. And in reality, we found out from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that when we pray, in what the way we word it is, in the Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit, when we pray utilizing another tongue, it's not the Spirit of God praying through us. It is our Spirit praying. So when you understand the truth about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what the, what the actual reality is, when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, God is breathing life 
back into your spiritual man. Adam disobeyed God in the, in the garden. When Adam was first created, God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became what? A living soul. When man disobeyed God, he was now forced to occupy a demoted state of existence. We now are flesh and blood bodies, but we possess a soul. We possess a spirit. Man is trifold, body, soul, and spirit. The problem is our soul is now like Adam, like Adam's after he disobeyed God. The Lord said, In the day that thou eatest of the tree and the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. What people don't understand is Adam died that day. He spiritually died. Now he has to live out a human existence spiritually dead. The whole reason Jesus came is the word of God said we were dead in our trespass and sins. Isn't that how the word of God describes us prior to uh, being born again? Yes, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And so the Lord said to Nicodemus in the garden uh, one evening in John chapter 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And the Lord said, no, no, no. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. So you're born once in the flesh, but now you need a second birth. But what is that second birth? Being born physically again? No, 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 no. Now you need to be born spiritually again because your spirit man within is without life and it needs life so when God in, in, uh, invests the baptism of the Holy Ghost in us what he is doing is he is giving mouth to mouth resuscitation to our spiritual man our soul our soul then comes to life. Now we have a living soul. And the soul, Jesus said, he that believeth on me shall what? Never die. Well, but wait a minute. Janelle just died. Dorothy died. Travis died. They all believed on him. Yeah, but the difference is if you're born again the Bible way, your spiritual man will continue to live. Because God has breathed new life into you through the born-again experience, okay? When the Holy Ghost comes into our life and breathes life into our spirit, this is why, to help you understand this uh, metaphor, this is why before he ascended, the Word of God said Jesus breathed on his disciples. He blew on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now it does not say that they then received the Holy Ghost. But he did this, and then he said to them, Now tarry ye in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon you. What was the promise of the Father? The infilling of the Holy Ghost. He said, But ye shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So now they go to the upper room, and for 10 days they're praying and waiting. They don't know what to expect. They don't know how the Holy Ghost coming, you know, what, what it's going to look like. What They have no clue. Nobody has told them, um, when the Holy Ghost comes, you're going to speak with tongues. Nobody has told them, when the Holy Ghost comes, you're going to see tongues of fire. Nobody has told them. They don't know what it's going to look like, okay? 
But then finally the word of God said in the book of Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a Jewish uh, celebration and feast celebrating the harvest and the fruits of the harvest. And so the word of God said when this holiday had fully arrived, when the morning had broken and this holiday now officially began, interesting celebration of the first harvest, that's when the Lord now, listen carefully, breathed from heaven no longer as this little man Jesus, but now as God. And the Bible said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. <sighs> Receive you the Holy Ghost. <sighs> Here it comes. His act was prophetic. Now this sound of a rushing mighty wind fills the building where the disciples are gathered. There are about 120, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. She needed the Holy Ghost too. There were no exceptions. And the word of God said, and suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they all, not some, not most, not many, they all began to speak with other tongues. They all began to speak in languages they did not know cognitively as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now here's the key. Does that mean that the Spirit was speaking through them and, and enabling them to speak? No, 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 no. I remember Brother, uh, the pastor I served my internship with, Brother Carver and I had a discussion one day and he had it in his head, just like most Pentecostal folks do, that every time you speak in tongues, it has to be God is, you know, enabling you at that moment. Every single time, you know, God is enabling you. Because after all, it says, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And uh, he and I were talking, I'll never forget it, we were in his van, I think we were going to camp meeting together or something. And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I know the word of God said we speak in tongues as the Spirit gives us the utterance. He said, but all I have to do is start worshiping the Lord and boom, here it comes. He said, it's almost like I have a certain amount of control, I have a certain amount <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Brother, the word of God, Paul said, when we speak in an unknown tongue, it's our spirit that's praying. So all a believer has to do to speak in an unknown tongue is, and you learn to do this, you learn to kind of get in the spirit, you get you kind of, I'm trying to think of the way I want to word this, you, you kind of, uh, I guess in a sense, you pull back into yourself at a certain level and just allow your spiritual man to express itself. And that's not altogether hard to do. When, when you've been in this thing a while, you learn. It, you know, you learn how to do this. And... Uh, that's why the Apostle John said in the book of Revelation, he said, uh, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. When he had his vision, when he had his experience, and the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to John as God, uh, and John wound up writing the book of Revelation, John started out saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Meaning, he was in prayer, he was in worship, and he had withdrawn, so to speak, into himself, and he was in the Spirit. 
Now you can become so much in the spirit, literally, that you literally kind of just disconnect from the world around you. Now, again, I'm going to give you an example from Scripture. The Apostle Peter, the Bible said in the book of Acts, he was on the rooftop praying, if you remember, said the people downstairs were making dinner ready. They were making food ready. He was hungry. But he got up on the roof and he was praying, and the Word of God said he fell into a trance. Now, if I said in the modern church, if I said somebody fell into a trance, I'd have some ding coming after me telling me that, oh, that's, you know, that's old cult language. That's this, that's that. No. All it means is that Peter, in a sense, became so engrossed in the spirit that he literally just kind of lost his connection to this world and he was just completely and utterly in his spirit. And he was communicating with the Lord and talking to the Lord in from the in from his spirit. And all of a sudden he was hungry, but he lost track of time. He lost and I've experienced this. Many people uh, have experienced this where you go into prayer and you get in the spirit. You and all of a sudden you don't realize it, but you literally have gotten so much in the spirit that you've been there by the time you kind of come out of it and you look at your watch, you say, oh my goodness, it's been six hours. You had no idea, had absolutely no idea because you literally were in the spirit. You were completely and utterly in the spirit. Now, then there, there's the, the other expression, like speaking with other tongues, where you're not necessarily so uh, immersed in the Spirit, as it were, but at the same time, you are at a certain level, you've withdrawn and you've allowed your Spirit, you know. And when a person begins to pray in the Spirit, or, and I hate that I actually hate using the term speak in tongues because I think people have so mishmashed that and made a mess out of you know what it even means. But when you pray in the spirit, when you pray with your spirit, you know, like Paul said earlier in the 14th chapter that we talked about last week, you're communicating directly with God. And we're going to talk about it a little bit later in our study. But the Word of God actually teaches that when we pray with our spirit, the Spirit of God is helping us to pray. When we pray in the Spirit, see, when you get in the Spirit, you're literally, in a sense, you're opening the pipeline between you and heaven. God is a spirit, Jesus said. They that worship Him must worship him not should not could not can must worship him in spirit and in truth in order to when we pray in the spirit when we pray with our spirit the spirit of God within us is helping our spiritual man to pray and the word of God this is what the scriptures teach and the Word of God tells us that when we pray in the Spirit, listen to this, we always pray according to the will of God. See, in your flesh, in yourself, when you're approaching things from your head, you can ask God for all kinds of stupid things. You can ask God for all kinds of things the Lord doesn't want you to have and you don't need. But when you pray in the Spirit... You are always praying, always according to the will of God. Wow. So if the Lord wants you to go to Indonesia as a missionary, you may be praying, Father, make a way for me to go to Indonesia and be a missionary as you've called me to be. And you don't even realize you're praying that. 
But you are. Because the Spirit of God is helping our spiritual man to pray. You see, spirit to spirit. God doesn't take over your body. God doesn't take command of your body. No, no, no. That's not how it works. But when the Spirit of God comes into our life, He then works with our spirit. And because it's spirit to spirit, just like in the Garden of Eden, the Bible said that Adam walked with the Lord in the garden in the cool of the day. Well, it's spirit to spirit. You see, all of a sudden now we're able to experience this communion and this fellowship with the Lord and this intimacy with God that you cannot experience without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No matter how wonderful it is to walk in relationship with the Lord. And it is wonderful to walk in relationship. Remember what I talked about when I preached recently about uh, the blind man and how the Lord led him out of the city before he performed the miracle in, on his eyes? The Lord leads us. Many of us are walking in relationship with the Lord. Yeah, the Lord's leading you. The Lord's walking with you. Absolutely. But there's more. There's still more. The Lord could have just led the guy out of town and had a wonderful conversation with him and let him go home blind. But no, there was more. And when he touched the man the first time, the man's eyes, they began to open. His sight began to come back, but not clearly. And many of us who are in the church, but we haven't yet received the Holy Ghost, that's exactly the place we're in. Our eyes are partially open. We're, yeah, we're talking to the Lord. The Lord's talking to us. He's walking with us. He's leading us. Yes, all of that is true. But there is still more. But that more comes with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is why every believer ought to desire and want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This, I can't for the life of me understand how anybody would not want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For me personally, I can't understand it. I got it when I was a kid. I remember listening to Brother Couts, a visiting evangelist in our church, preach. And he was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said, God wants uh, his people to be filled with the Spirit. The Word of God said, Be ye not drunken with wine, as is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And I went to that altar in that little church in Naugatuck, Connecticut, and I went down to that altar and I said, Lord, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I didn't know, I was literally about five. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how to, you know. <laughs> but I wanted it. I, I, I just, based on what I heard, I was supposed to get it and I needed it and I wanted it. And I'm down there just praying my little heart out. And I'm praying. Nobody was around me. Nobody, you know, I'm partly because I'm sure I'm just a kid. They, they figured, you know, why bother with a little kid bless his little heart. But I was always very precocious for my age. So, I, you know, I was five years old physically, but honestly, I, I acted and people thought I was about 10. And so, literally. And uh, I was always a big kid besides. And anyhow, next thing I know, I literally remember just I'm praying, and all of a sudden, I'm ba -ra -ba 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 and I'm praying in another language. I went home so delirious. Oh my goodness, I was so thrilled. I was so happy. I remember literally, I remember going home. And my mother wasn't in that service. My grandmother had taken us. Our church was in revival, which is uh, you have church every night for a period of time. 
and grandma had taken us and I'd come home and I, uh, oh, every, every lamppost I saw I was in love with, every tree, everything literally looked new to me. I, I don't even know how to describe it. Everything looked new to me. Everybody looked new to me. Everything. All of a sudden I loved the telephone poles and I loved the trees and I loved the birds and I loved the everything. And when I got home, I just shouted to my mom, I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. I was so thrilled that I'd received the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to utilize it. I didn't know how to get in the spirit because I was a kid. And nobody back then, especially, I hate to say, but a lot of the teaching that we offer, folks, I wish people could appreciate what this church offers. I wish to God we had people who, who even had a, enough sense to appreciate what is being offered here. I wish I'd had teaching like this when I was young. Oh my goodness. My walk with God could have been so much different if I'd have had this kind of teaching. It wasn't a matter of we had bad teaching or wrong teaching. We just didn't have very in-depth teaching about a lot of things. A lot of things in the Pentecostal movement, it was just like accepted that this is what it is, you know. This is what it is. You receive the Holy Ghost, you speak with other tongues, you know, you eventually can learn to kind of pray in the spirit and you know I mean but but there was nobody explaining any of this even though scripture offered explanation but I think the problem is a lot of people just didn't have the revelation or the understanding of how to put the different I talk about line upon line precept upon precept they didn't understand how to put the different pieces together well, I don't understand how the Word of God said that they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance, but then Paul says our spirit's praying. You know what I'm saying? And, and maybe they couldn't quite put that together, and if they'd have talked to the Lord about it, he'd have showed them. But that's the problem. The Word of God said, you have not, because you ask not. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I've preached on this before. Um, a lot of times people walk in spiritual ignorance because nobody's asking. When you think you already know the answer, why are you going to ask a question? Many in the church world today already think they know the answer, so therefore they never ask the question. Well, if you never ask the question, you're never going to get the answer. Me, on the other hand, personally, I've spent my entire life and my entire ministry wanting to understand, as Paul described it, the deeper things of God. I want to understand. Lord, I, I don't want to just know that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you speak with other tongues. Why do you speak with other tongues? You know, what's the purpose of it? What benefit? What value is it? You know what I'm saying? In my little mind, I'm asking all these questions, and I'm certain. And guess what? Scripture answers, you know, the apostles in their writing answer all these questions, you know? So let's continue now with uh, where we left off last week. I'm an old man these days. I need my glasses. Last week we left off at verse 26, and I said this week we would begin at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26. So the Apostle Paul now writes, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath a an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. It says, everybody in your little charismatic church comes to church, and boy, y'all just, every one of you got something. 
If you ain't got a message to offer in tongues, you, then you're the one that's going to interpret. If you're, if you're not uh, offering a message in tongues or interpreting the message in tongues, then you're claiming God's given you some unique revelation. And it's not that he hasn't. It's not that... Uh, because honestly, this is why God gives us teachers and pastors. Because... A lot of times, if they're doing their job right, he's able to help them into revelation and understanding, and then they, in turn, share that with the people. But he says, every one of you, in other words, basically what it amounts, every one of you comes to church ready to preach. That's, that's kind of what he's saying, okay? Every one of you comes to church like you got something to offer better than everybody else. You got something to offer different than everybody else. And he says, how is this? He said, no, let everything be done unto edification. It's about the church. It's about the people of God. It's about the work of God. It's not about you. It's not about your brandishing this great spirituality. It's not about you claiming, oh, I'm so spiritual. Every Sunday I come to church and God showed me a new doctrine. God showed me a new revelation. And you got to remember, this is, the, none of these people had the Bible. So there were a lot of doctrines, there were a lot of revelations that weren't committed to paper as of yet, okay? A lot of explanations. And so um, these people are just coming in. They got all kind of directions they can go in, okay? They don't have the written word of God to kind of keep them in check and keep them on the straight, on the straight and narrow. See, nowadays, we are blessed because we do have the Word of God. We do have the complete teaching and instruction of the apostles. And therefore, we're able to bounce when somebody gets up and prophesies or somebody gets up and preaches some kind of a doctrine. We're able to weigh that against the written Word. They didn't have that. So it could be very easy for them to get way off track and go off in the boondocks somewhere. Okay? So Paul said, no, you know, it's not about your showcasing your great talent or your great wisdom or your great revelation. I'm going to tell you, there are too many people in the church, even in ministry, who are there for all the wrong reasons. There are too many people in the church who do f spiritual things for all the wrong reasons. They're trying so hard to look spiritual. I, I have a family member in my mind this very moment. This individual's passed away, so, you know, but I still don't want to go into too great a detail. But this person, honestly, a lot of, her actions and a lot of the way she did things in the church and out of the church, I really think was honestly just trying to show how spiritual she was. You know what I'm saying? And that's what Paul's talking about here. So, you know, y'all are coming in. Every one of you got something going on. But in the end, it's not about the church. It's about you. We've got to be careful of that. I don't want the gifts of the Spirit operating through me to make me look like anything. I care less about that. That's why I said I've had people, I've had pastors and different ones introduce me to their church, and they've said, oh, he's a prophet, he's a, an apostle, he's this, he's that. And... Um, and I'll tell them in a flat second, brother, next time you introduce me, let's not do all that. I don't need that. I don't want it. I don't need it. I prefer you didn't do it. Tommy and I, we had our outreach center in, in uh, Dallas 
the bookstore and the coffee shop, and this lady came to me. Oh, I'm a prophetess, and oh, I would like. I wrote a book, and I would love to to do a book signing at your store and at your outreach center, and and do a little. Uh, presentation and and I have a lot of people that I could get to come and blah, blah. well of course we needed all the help we could for uh, uh, letting people know our our outreach center was there so you know and and we wanted to do some activities that were kind of um, different whatever so I you know I said okay so we decided to do it her little book was the most idiotic self-published triple spaced I'm not joking I'm as serious as Arte the lines were triple spaced in the book because there really was nothing more than an oversized um, article that she stretched out to make it fill 40 pages triple spaced so she could call it a book. Then she shows up. She's wearing this most outlandish, goofy, crazy outfit you ever saw in your life. She's got a woman, a friend of hers who gets it, and she did bring in a lot of people. Quite a few people came. Probably 30 people were there. And... Uh, most of them people that you know in response to whatever she was doing and uh, she had a friend get up and give the most asinine overblown idiotic ridiculous introduction that i've ever seen in my life my God Almighty, she had this woman walking on water. She had this woman predicting the future. She had this woman, a great author, and blah, blah, blah. Honey, come on, let's be realistic. This is a self published book, let. And yet, to hear the introduction, and, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to get on some people's bad side. This is all too common in certain minority churches. This woman happened to be a lady of color. This kind of foolishness goes on way too often. Way too often. People use the ministry as a way to pad their ego. They use the ministry as a way to feel like royalty. They use the ministry as a way to fill their pockets with titles and to boost their self-esteem. And what you don't see is people who actually approach ministry as the Word of God teaches it ought to be approached. And that is with humility and self-control. It's not about you. Never was about you. Never will be about you. And the minute it becomes about you, then, honey, it's no longer about Jesus and you're out of order. And that woman was so out of order, that whole thing turned me off so bad. And I told Tommy, I said, never again. We are never again going to let this woman do anything here. That was the most insane pile of manure I've ever seen in my life. We got preachers who pastor little storefront churches calling themselves apostles. Oh, really? Did, have you witnessed, have you seen the Lord since his resurrection? Have you physically seen Jesus since his resurrection? Because i got news for you. To be an apostle, that is one of the requirements. I'm just curious. Have you seen him since he rose from the dead? 
but they use these titles as a means of padding themselves. And too many believers in a lot of these churches aren't spiritual enough themselves to realize that this practice is wrong. I don't need anybody. The man who ordained me was a mainstream apostolic pastor who asked to ordain me. I've got it on record. I've got, you can listen to it on YouTube. I've got the, the, the sound of the service on YouTube. I mean, yeah, on YouTube. And, um, and he talks about, oh, you know, Brother Charles has had the ministry, you know, he's, he's um, Fulfilled all five offices and blah, blah, blah. Mm. My Bible said that the city of New Jerusalem is going to have 12 foundations, and in the 12 foundations are the name of the 12 apostles. How are you going to tell me there's more than 12 apostles? Now, I know there are people watching me right now who'd argue this point with me up and down. And 99% of, of the people who will argue with me are going to be from a minority community. I guarantee it. Because that's where you most see the push for titles. Oh, you call so-and-so a prophet. You call so-and-so an apostle. You call so-and-so bishop. You know, you call blah, blah, blah. Titles are so important. No, they're not. Brother Gillum pastored one of the greatest churches I've ever had the honor in my life of being part of, and he went by Brother Gillum. That's all he ever called him was Brother Gillum. Nobody ever called him Bishop. Nobody ever called him Pastor Gillum for that matter. He just went by Brother Gillum. I grew up in Pentecostal church growing up as a kid. You know, we called my pastors. We called them Brother Barlow, Brother Babcock, Brother... Harmon, that's what we call them. You see, there was humility present. There was no need for titles. We knew they were the pastor. That, that wasn't the problem. You know? The only reason I even will uh, identify myself, and I call myself Pastor Charles, is in our community, I have learned that because of the treatment many people in our community have experienced, there tends to be a, a lot of animosity toward people who are in ministry. And there is a complete disconnect in our community. There is a complete disregard and lack of proper uh, respect for God called men and women. When I first started in this, I didn't know this. You know, this came to me over the years of working in affirming ministry. And I realized at some point, you, you have to use the title as a means of at least trying at some level to establish the fact that you're supposed to hold men and women of God up. Not elevate them, you know, but you're supposed to have proper respect for them. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the only reason I started using Pastor Charles, because there was just a complete and utter lack of respect in our community for anyone in ministry. And I tried I try to use it as a way of like, you know, establishing some sort of a proper boundary, you know, for respect. And I'm expecting you don't have to think I'm Jesus. You don't have to think I walk on water. But you need to respect people that God has called and ordained and established to do his work because, honey, I got news for you. I don't know about the ones out there doing it as a 
profession. I don't know about those out there doing it for all the wrong reasons, but I know about those of us that are doing it for the right reasons. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. We pay one devil of a price to obey our calling. We pay one dickens of a price to do what God has called us to. You know how much easier it would have been for me over the last 30 years, just go out and get a secular job, make a living, and bring home some money. And, you know, you know how much easier Tommy and my life could have been if I could have done that? But my whole life, even when I was out of church for three years, and I was in a relationship with somebody else, and uh, I used to tell him, I used to, <laughs> I used to tell Jason all the time, I said, Every time I take a job, I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I knew I was called and I knew what my responsibility before God was, but I wasn't doing it. I was Jonah on the ship trying to go the opposite direction and honey, I wasn't stupid enough, enough not to know that I was on a ship going in the opposite direction. I knew good and well I was. And uh, when God has called somebody, he said, he told his disciples, he, he said, the, wor the world hated me, they're going to hate you. You better believe that's the truth. You better believe ministers get the brunt of negativity and criticism and people want to sit and judge every cotton pick and word that comes off your lips you are not permitted to be human. You are not permitted to have even the slightest fault. You are not permitted to have any feelings. You are not permitted anything if you're in ministry. Oh, no, 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 no. You'll be called a hypocrite. You'll be called um, apostate. You'll be called everything under the sun. There are people out there who hate my guts. Because 20 years ago, they wanted me to join a group they were putting together. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not interested. And they literally have been working against me for 20 solid years. Doing everything in their power, everything in their power, to destroy my reputation, to tear down my integrity. Doing everything in their power, no matter where I go, Dallas, Atlanta, Anywhere I go, they have done nothing but sow seeds of negativity and nastiness about me. Oh, did I mention these are supposed to be LGBT-affirming Pentecostals? Why? Because I didn't want to be part of their club. I didn't like the spirit they had. I didn't like the way they operated. I didn't like some of the things they did, the way they did things. And honestly, there was some very sinful, vulgar, nasty stuff going on that I wasn't about to be part of either. Have I run around for 20 years talking about them? Do you hear me running around every Sunday talking about them? Nope. Nope. I'm too busy doing the work God's called me to do. Say, okay, okay, Pastor, get on point. I'm trying to help you understand, folks. There are too many people, like Paul's talking about here, who are so busy trying to demonstrate and prove their spirituality and trying to prove, you know, their position and they're using titles and they're using all this... Uh, feigned spirituality to demonstrate how wonderful and how spiritual they are. It's not about you. Never has been about you. And we've got to get away from that foolishness. Listen, you don't want God to humble you. The Bible said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Trust me, you would rather fall on the rock than have the rock fall on you. You don't want the Lord to humble you. Because if he humbles you, 
you're going to fall hard. If you humble yourself, you can have a soft landing. Okay? So let's go on from here now. Verse 27, Paul said, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most, by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Aha, uh -huh. so here Paul says, Listen, folks, y'all come to church, and you got 50 people claiming they have a message to give in tongues, you know? And everybody's competing with one another. Then this is how out of order the Corinthian church had gotten. They'd gotten so completely mixed up and screwed up. Again, you have to understand, they didn't have instruction. They didn't have teaching. That's why Paul wrote this epistle. They didn't have the Bible to go to in order to kind of set guidelines and help them apply some practical uh, rules and practical guidelines, okay? They had people literally, and you'll see what I mean as we move on with this chapter, they had people competing with one another to offer messages in tongues. You have this guy over here, then the next guy, the next guy, as if no, mine's more important than yours. No, mine's more important than yours. So Paul said, no, no, mm -mm, no. So listen, there, there, are some, there are some guidelines that I'm going to set down for you. He said, let it be by two or by three. In other words, don't be having no chain of people trying to outdo each other. He said, you might have two, said you might even go three, but that's it. You better not go past three. But listen, he said, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So he says, in other words, if you got a message and somebody's already speaking, then you keep your mouth shut till they're done. Not only should their message be done, but the interpretation should be given first. Then you go. You follow? Then you offer. So he's saying, I don't want y'all out screaming each other. L let it be by two or by three, and that by course or in proper order. Okay, he said, and let one interpret, so let, let each be interpreted, okay? So when a message comes out in tongues, that's why we quietly wait for the interpretation. That is, and, and it's so funny because, like I told you before, you don't even need someone to teach you to do that, so to speak. The Spirit of the Lord literally will just silence. The, I, it's the most amazing thing. I grew up in it, and even as a kid, I used to think, it is just amazing how that works, you know? This way, it's not just a bunch of noise and confusion. There is a certain uh, cadence, there is a certain order, there is a certain structure. Now listen, Paul continues, he said, let the prophets, or I'm sorry, wait a minute, uh, verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, if you don't see, if you're not aware of someone in the congregation who has the gift of interpretation of tongues, and generally speaking, you know who those people are in the church, he said, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, don't be raising your voice as if you have a message to offer if there's no interpreter. 
because it's not appropriate that a message be given and there not be an interpretation. Any time a message is given, there is always, 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 always to be an interpretation that follows. He said, otherwise, just keep it to yourself and to God. Now, obviously, he taught us already earlier in the, in the chapter, when you pray in an unknown tongue, he said, you're speaking to God. You're not speaking to man. So he's saying, basically, in other words, keep it at that personal level versus you know, when someone has a message in tongues, um, they usually will cry it out. They, they, I mean, they really blurt it out, you know. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how the Spirit of the Lord inspires it in you. I, I, I've had it happen, so I know, um, I can't even explain it. It's like, uh, you you suddenly feel like the Holy Ghost is inspiring you to speak out and you feel that need to speak out and uh, you have a certain amount of control because remember it's all about letting your spirit it's still part of you so you can still uh, the Bible actually talks about quench not the Holy Ghost which means when God's trying to do something in you and through you, don't stop it. Don't prevent it from happening. Because you can do that too, okay? But if you feel a message, you can wait until an opportune moment to begin to offer it. If the preacher's preaching, I'm not saying you have to wait till he's done preaching, no. But you can wait until perhaps he stops to take a breath or he finishes a thought, then you can offer. Do you see what I'm saying? This way there's not just confusion. You're not screaming over somebody. If somebody else is already offering a message in tongues and you're feeling that inspiration, that, that urge to offer a message, then you need to hold yourself until that is done and the interpretation has been offered then, of course, you're able to go. Now, obviously, for Paul to offer these guidelines, you have to have a certain amount of control. Why would he say, you know, let one wait and blah, 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 if you have no control over it? So if somebody says, oh, I just couldn't control it. I just had to let it rip, you know. No, no, you do have a certain amount of control. Matter of fact, you have so much control, you can quench it. You can literally put that fire out, so to speak. God inspires you to prophesy, or God inspires you to offer a message in tongues, and you sit on it, you're too afraid to offer it, you're too afraid to do it, and you sit on it, and you sit on it, and then the Spirit of the Lord will just withdraw that. Say, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep pressing you to offer this if you're not gonna do it. And that, that sensation or that internal um, inspiration, you know, will kind of just dissipate. It'll go away. So you can quench the spirit. <sighs> Paul said, uh, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Then he said in verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Now this is interesting. Verse 31, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Verse 32, And the spirits of the prophets, not the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What's interesting here is Paul offers different counsel when it comes 
to prophecy. You remember with tongues and interpretation, he said if one is speaking, then you wait. You wait for the interpretation, then you offer yours in order. He said when it comes to prophecy, he said if one is prophesying, and then another begins to prophesy, the first is to hold his peace. So that with prophets, each one that prophesies yields to the next. See, it's different. It's a whole different operation than with tongues and interpretation. And Paul says, you can all prophesy as long as it's done in order and as long as only one is speaking at any given time. So if one is prophesying and then another begins to prophesy, then the first has to hold his peace and yield to the next. Now mind you, you have to understand, God is working through all this. These people aren't just making stuff up in their head. Okay, that, that's, if, if that's all it was, uh, it would be one thing. But God, the Spirit of the Lord is working. The Spirit of the Lord is placing a prophetic word in someone to offer in prophecy. And God knows when that prophetic word it's over when it's done, okay? <laughs> the Lord knows when that prophetic word is done, and therefore a person may be just coming up on their the end of their prophecy, and they're not even quite done yet, and the next person just picks up immediately and starts to prophesy. And at that point, the first person is to immediately just stop and yield to the next. See the difference in prophecy versus... Now there's kind of a reason for this if you think about it. The Lord may be offering a message to the church and he's tag teaming it. He's given part of it through this guy, then the next part through this guy, the next part through that guy, the next part through that guy, the next part through that lady, the next part through that lady, you know what I'm saying? And so therefore, with prophecy, it's different. No, each one is to cut themselves off and to stop speaking when another begins, okay? And again, this is a sign, folks, of a certain level of spiritual maturity. When you can prophesy and someone else begins to prophesy and you can just simply say, okay, I'm done then. You know, the Lord wants me to stop at this point. I'll stop. If the Lord wants you to say anything more, then at the right time, he'll let you know, pick it up now and start, you know, and, and prophesy again. Uh, but the bottom line is, whether it be with tongues and interpretation, or whether it be prophecy, there is always to be a certain cadence, there is to be a certain order, there's to be a certain structure. God does not do things in a haphazard, confusing, noisy, you know, rock concert sort of a way, okay? And part of what helps you to know it is God is when you see this order and this structure being followed. But Paul said when the prophets prophesy, he said, um, the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet. Remember what I said a little while ago about you have a certain amount of control. I know for me, when I prophesy spontaneously, okay, when, in other words, when the Lord gives me a spontaneous prophecy to speak, for me personally, I know it's, it's, 
I all of a sudden I just feel this in my spirit I feel the need to say something and without fail there's a certain identifier at the start of a prophetic word and that identifier most of the time is going to be thus saith the Lord okay and when I feel in my spirit like God is is putting thus saith the Lord in my spirit and telling me you need to speak thus saith the Lord that's all I know right then and there that's all I know in other words he's basically telling me I'm cueing you I want you to prophesy all I know is the first three words, thus saith the Lord, or four words, thus saith the Lord. That's all I know. I wait until the right moment. If, if I'm not preaching or up front or whatever, uh, if I'm in a song service or whatever the case might be, you know, I wait until maybe the song ends, you know, and then I'll begin to speak what the Lord, and then, honey, it just flows. All of a sudden, every word, is just flowing. I'm saying it before I even know what I'm saying half the time. And uh, that's how a spontaneous prophecy works. For me, it may not work that way for a lot of people. May The Lord may kind of give them a preview of what they're to say, you know. I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm not claiming the mechanics of it for me or the mechanics of it for everybody, you know. But I'm just simply saying there is a certain amount of control. You, the prophet, has control of his own spirit. And again, here's that, that understanding. We're not talking about the Holy Ghost. We're not talking about you're controlling the Holy Ghost. No, no, no. You have control of your own spirit. Because when you pray in an unknown tongue, it is your spirit that prays. You see, I'm trying. I'm trying to combat that that old wrong mindset that everything in the spirit is the Holy Ghost doing it. You know, no, it's not. It's your spirit doing it. But it's the spirit of God within you that is inspiring it to be done. If you follow what I'm saying, okay. All right. So the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet said ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted and the spirits of the prophet are subject unto the uh, subject to the prophets verse 33 for God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints now I'm about to get into a passage a verse that creates a lot of problems in the church world today and there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have trouble with this verse 34 let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, this is part of what Baptist folk use to say that women are not supposed to teach and they're not supposed to preach. Well, first of all, we know, according to the Word of God, that women prophesy. We know that according to the word of God in the last days, the word of God said, I will pour out of my spirit uh, upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Upon my handmaids, upon my servants, will I pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So we know that women and men prophesy. Why all of a sudden is Paul saying, now the women need to keep quiet. This is one of those instances where you have to understand context. In the Jewish faith, 
women and men are segregated. The men sit in the center of the synagogue, go to any Jewish synagogue, except, of course, the more modern Reformed, okay? But you go to a traditional synagogue, and what you're going to find is you have in your sanctuary, the main area is down, you know, like a regular sanctuary, and then a lot of times on either side, they have a slightly elevated area with seating. That's where the women sit, off on the sides. The men sit in the center. Oh, I got people already just ired up and ready to fire off, you know, all kinds of rockets. Folks, this is not about elevating men. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. It is about holding men to a higher standard. There is more required of men than there was of women, spiritually and otherwise. Men were expected to protect their families. They were expected to provide for their families. When it came to spiritual things, they were expected to lead their families. Therefore, they're in the center because we want, we want the men where they are able to pay attention, look straight ahead and see what's going on. In ancient times, it was common for women who might be in the synagogue to try to talk to their husband during the course of the service. Well, if you're sitting over here and your husband's in the center area somewhere, even if he's sitting on the edge of the center area and you're just separated by an aisle, you've got a woman, you know, and you're creating distraction, you're creating confusion, you're making noise. This is what Paul was addressing. He's, in modern times, we're not, sit, we're not segregated like this. We're not seated like this. Is it sinful for a woman to lean over and whisper something to her husband? No, because in modern times, that uh, can be done. In biblical times, in the Lord's day, they couldn't do that. If a woman was going to try to address her husband, either she's going to have to get up and walk to the, and usually they have a rail. So she's having to lean over the rail, try to get her husband's attention, even if he's sitting right on the outside. Do you follow what I'm saying? No matter how you slice it, it's going to be distracting. It is going to create potential noise and confusion. And Paul said, no, 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 we, we don't have that. Don't be doing that, okay? So really, when you understand the context of the times and you understand things, then suddenly this passage isn't nearly as troublesome as it is if you just read it as if God dropped it out of heaven, you know, but that is not at all what's going on. Paul wrote this epistle to the Corinthians because they had the charismatic spirit running loose among them, and they had were doing things out of order. We understand that. Well, his comments about women in the church, again, he is addressing a very real issue and a very real problem. Okay? So that's all Paul's talking about. If he were to say the same identical thing about children, you would understand that, and you wouldn't even think about it. Well, no, because children are supposed to know their place. Well, at that time, you have to understand, it's a very patriarchal society, and the man is responsible for spiritual leadership in his home. So if the woman has a question about something the, the rabbi is saying or something the rabbi is teaching or what have you, Paul said, 
then let him ask her husband about it at home. Wait till they get home, then talk about it. Because to try to have any kind of a conversation during the course of the service is going to be distracting and it's going to cause confusion, okay? You don't want that. Do you follow? Also, you're then taking the husband's attention away from what's going on in the service and you don't want to do that either because again he's in the middle for a reason because God holds him to a higher standard let me tell you something everything you read in Paul's teaching people love to talk about Paul being a chauvinist and being a sexist and blah blah blah, blah. but what they don't understand is that the Jewish faith and the Jewish scriptures were absolutely patriarchal in, in their, their arrangement. But the way that evangelicals have taken it and tried to paint it as though men are the smarter, men are the stronger, men are the better, blah, 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 that is not at all why God did it the way he did it. You. He did it because he holds men to a higher standard. They are responsible for more than he holds the woman to. There is nothing wrong with having, oh, I'm going to say this, and boy, I'm going to get a lot of people. I know, I know our community, you know, if you're not hyper liberal and teaching all kinds of crap that contradicts everything the church ever said, then you're in the wrong, you know, in, in the LGBT community. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. There is nothing wrong with having roles in the home. There is nothing wrong with one person assuming the headship and the other yielding to that headship or the other submitting to that headship. There's nothing wrong with that. You know why? Because the person who's assuming the headship, it's not about them being greater and better and blah, blah, blah. No, they're taking on the greater responsibility. Do you follow? This is what ought to be taught in the church. Husbands, you are given the greater responsibility. That's why. That's why you're supposed to be the head in your home. Not because you're innately greater just because you have a woo-woo and your wife doesn't. That's not at all how that works. No. God designed things in such a way so that there would be those in the home who would be held to a greater responsibility. And there would be those in the home who would not have to bear that responsibility. Now, are there times when that order doesn't work? Guess what? In the real world, absolutely there are. Absolutely. You know, there's an old saying. There's an exception to every rule. I, my aunt and uncle... To be honest, that I came to, when I went to Texas and stayed with my great aunt and uncle, my great uncle had very little education. He was country as country can be. And Tommy knows. I mean, that man was so country. And, and if you understand Texas country folk, you know, this man had no education. He had, he had very little, you know, anything okay my aunt on the other hand my great aunt grew up in connecticut i got news for you up north education was extremely important and everybody graduated high school i don't care if you were uh you know back in the 20s you know uh, they did everything in their power to make sure their kids graduated and you know got a good education uh, she got some education not college or anything she knew how to write a check. She knew how to balance a checkbook. She, you know, she knew how to do some of these things. He had no clue. My uncle would tell you, I heard him say it probably a hundred times. 
If I had married Dorothy, I'd have never owned a house. I'd have never owned a car. I'd have never had nothing. Because I didn't know the first thing in the universe about doing any of that. Okay? In their home, at many levels, and all Baptist folks are going to swallow their gum when I say this, at many levels, my aunt kind of assumed the headship role. And my uncle didn't fight with her over it, but he yielded to that, and he let her be the head, and he uh, submitted himself to her headship when it came to business and things. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? LGBT couples, I'm going to tell you, if you both are going to fight and argue over who's running the show and who has the final word, your relationship is not going to last real long. Some people are born leaders. That's just the reality of life. My God, take 50 people have a plane wreck, you know, out in the, in the boondock somewhere. And somebody in that group is going to stand up and say, folks, I think I know what we need to do. Here's how we need to, you know. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, that would be me if, if I were involved in a plane wreck, you know. Now, if somebody else said, well, I, I have this knowledge, and based on my knowledge, I think blah, 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 blah. And I see, yeah, that guy knows better than I do. I'm going to submit because I'm not stupid. I'm going to submit and say, okay, then you lead. Do you know what I'm saying? But as a rule, I've always been a problem solver. I am not, uh, and I tease Tommy about this all the time. You know, I say, you, you can identify the problem in a minute. Boy, I mean, if somebody needs to articulate what the problem is, my boobie's there to tell you what the problem is. The thing that irritates me is, instead of coming to me with the problem, for God's sakes, come to me with a suggestion for a solution. But you see, that's how my brain thinks. I'm When I'm hearing a problem, I'm immediately trying to work out a solution. There's books that have been written. One famous book that was written some years ago, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, you know. And it's funny because the author of that book makes it abundantly clear. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, not every man is 100% Mars and not every woman is 100% Venus. A lot of the attributes I ascribe to men, as it were, a woman can have, and vice versa. He said, so by no means am I saying, you know, all men are this way and all women are that way. He said, but as a rule, as a general rule, you will see more Mars in men than you will women and more Venus in women than you will men. But now you get into the LGBT, holy mackerel. And I believe it's completely natural. I think it's perfectly innate, you know. Some LGBT, some gay men have a whole lot more Venus than they do Mars. Right? Some, some gay women have much more Mars in them than the new Venus. Basically, in any home, you are going to have greater harmony and you're going to have things flow a whole lot smoother if you look at things realistically and honestly and say, which one of us has the greater portion of Mars and which one of us has the greater portion of Venus the one with more Mars than Venus really needs to be the one who is responsible for the greater part of decision making and what have you. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm also stubborn as a mule. I had a part of yours. I'm trying to finish up tonight. We're going to have to finish this chapter next week. 
years ago, I had a party in my home. I think it was for my birthday. And a bunch of my friends, this was in New York City when I lived in Brooklyn. Back then, I had quite a few friends. And I was in affirming ministry. And, uh, and But I, I had been in New York for many years. I knew a lot of people. A bunch of my friends came. We had a wonderful time. And one of my friends, this fellow I knew, decided he was going to light up a doobie in my living room. And as I am often wont to do, <laughs> I said, oh, no, 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 not in my house, you don't. Oh, it's just, you know, I said, no, no, <laughs> not in my house. Sorry, kiddo, I've got a no, no, none mind-altering substance, uh, you know, policy in my home. And, uh, and my friend, of course, you know, went along with that, as in, you know, um, yeah, I, you know. Well, my point is this. Tommy and I aren't going to stand here and argue. He's not going to sit here and say, well, you know, let him go ahead and do it, because, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, if he wants to do it, you know, it's, it's him, and he's not hurting anybody. But, but no, Tommy lets me set that standard for our home. Do you follow what I'm saying? He lets me, uh, and really, when you submit to someone, think about it, what you're really doing it's not about being subservient. It is about kind of allowing them, you know? You're going to dance with somebody on the dance floor. Honey, if you both try to lead, you're going to be stomping all over each other. Somebody's got to lead and somebody's got to follow. That's how dancing works. That is how marriage works. That is how relationships work. I don't care if they're straight, gay, or otherwise. Doesn't matter one iota. You better let somebody lead. You better let somebody be responsible for, for lack of a better phrase, for the final word on certain things, okay? And believe me, you will have much greater harmony in your home. You'll have greater harmony in your marriage. Um, you'll have greater harmony in your relationship if you're able to approach things from this perspective, okay? Now, it's five till nine, so I've gone as far as I can go today. So we made it so far. We are at verse number 38. So next week, is it 36 or 30? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It's verse 36, actually. It's hard for me to see. Okay, yeah, verse 36. So next week, next week we're going to begin at verse number 36. And uh, we should be able next week to finish this chapter, okay? And uh, then we'll be able to move on. We're going to look at some other things. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about any subject in Scripture, there are always kind of these peripheral matters that come into play. Tommy's winding up over there for us to have an argument. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I figured I'd say that because I'm sure somebody out there is just seething. But uh, I'm teasing. Um, but, but, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of good instruction that's been offered tonight even beyond the issue of the gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, and folks, believe me, uh, it really, God's Word offers great wisdom. And if we will follow the counsel of Scripture, if we'll follow the counsel of God's Word, I'm telling you, you will be amazed at how much more 
uh, harmonious your uh, marriage, your relationship, your um, life can be if we let the Word of God uh, instruct us and we don't fight it and, and uh, you know, rebel against it. Okay. All right. We're going to continue our study next week. I hope that what we talked about this week has been beneficial. Do know when I make the video of today's Bible study, uh, usually what I do every week, I cut out the time that I take for any uh, extraneous talk. So I'll be cutting out the first half hour where I was talking about my cousin and her passing and our relationship. I'll be cutting that out. So if you want to watch the Bible study when we have posted it to uh, YouTube, uh, it's going to only be the Bible study portion, okay? Won't be including that additional half hour. But I appreciate your indulgence. I kind of use you folks sometimes as a, a sounding board or a um, uh, huh? Outlet. Yeah, you know, as an outlet, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you're there. Let's close with prayer. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of the Spirit that allow you to communicate with your church, to offer blessing, to offer counsel. Lord, to offer us a slap on the hand when we need one. And Master, today in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that this time in your word has been beneficial to the people of God. Help us to lead this study tonight and to meditate and contemplate that which we have heard. And help us, Lord, to accept the counsel of your word. Even sometimes it goes against our, our personal thoughts and opinions, but help us to see the wisdom. You are our, our creator, and as our creator, you've offered us a handbook, and that handbook allows us to see how things can most effectively and efficiently operate. Help us to receive from your word the wisdom, the guidance, the instruction that we need, that we might have what you said you came to give us, life and life more abundant. Keep us, O oh God, forever in your care. Lord, touch Jennifer tonight, whatever she may be going through. I know this has to be a difficult time for her. We ask God that you'd be a comfort and a help to her to her children and, and grandchildren as they've lost an aunt and a great aunt. Master, in the name of Jesus, help us uh, in the weeks to come to do what we need to do to make wise decisions. Comfort, Lord, today. Help and heal. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I hope you'll join us Sunday at 3 o'clock for a celebration of life in Christ. Uh, and also next Wednesday, I hope you'll come be with us as we continue our Bible study on the gifts of the Spirit, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. In the meantime, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.